Everybody stretch your hand out toward the field. Say, preach the word, man of God. Preach the word. Always humble uh, to stand before my brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, share the word. I was afraid to touch Minister Norman. He had that stiller outfit on. I didn't want to get stiller on my hands. <laughs> but I love, I love him anyway. <laughs> One thing I know, we got to love Tom. I see some devoted Bingo fans in this black and yellow. I'm, I <laughs> Good thing it wasn't on Bingo week. <laughs> so uh, again, good morning. I uh, am Minister Phil Williams. Uh, with been here on, on and off of peace as I, you know, as you wrestle with a call uh, to get exactly what that call is, uh, as far as how that looks in 2023. How does that look walking that out? Um, so don't see me. Um, I am still very much sure in my faith. Stand firm in my faith. Um, and try and my best daily to live the gospel, knowing I fall short, but my Savior got me. So I'm excited to share the word this morning, and in particular because uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, and we don't want to make this about just one day where we celebrate time. It should be a, you know, an ongoing process for the man that's laboring on our behalf. Even though he's a Stiller fan as well, uh, Minister Norman, I didn't know. But uh, Tom, I know, has been a Stiller fan for a while, but we forgive him again. We love him. But Tom's heart has been on display quite often during my time here. Uh, he has been a man that has sought after living the gospel. Um, once where I've gotten a lot of my, when I've tried to live the gospel, a lot of it I've tried to emulate what I've seen him do in his family, uh, what I've seen him do in his walk here at the church, and also here in the community, whether that's through schoolwork, making sure he's reaching back and touching outside of the walls, so getting that as well. I've had conversations with Tom where he's helped me with fatherhood struggles, he's told me his struggles, I've shared with him my struggles, and he's never came out of me like condescending, and I'm sometimes can be a bit of a stubborn guy, and uh, I know sometimes he wanted to say, look man, I need you to get this, but he didn't, he was, always handled me with love, and I've always appreciated that. One way is that we, are, we were at a small group uh, for a married couple. And we were, I was complaining about cutting my backyard because my, one of the most things, I questioned my intelligence. We had a, we got a big hill in the backyard. Now at 28, the hill didn't look as big as it does now at 42. So <laughs> I'm looking at it now like, uh, what was you thinking? So, and I kind of like my grass a certain way, so I don't trust my sons with it yet. My oldest was cool, but he's moved, he's out of the house. So now the rest of them. They kind of do it like, let me hurry up and get back to Fortnite. And I'm like, no, then I have to make them redo it. Then I have to watch them. And then I have to, so I was like, you know what? I'll just do it myself. But I end up having, this particular time I'm complaining because my lawnmower, I had a riding lawnmower and it died. So now I'm walking the hill with the push mower. And that is more than I I had ever imagined. So I, uh, a few weeks later, I get a call and Tom says, look, man, I just got a new riding mower. Um, if you want to get my old one, just come pick it up, and uh, you can take it. She know my pride. I said, well, man, I got to give you something. He said, no, it was given to me, and now I'm giving it to you. Let me be a blessing. It's like, you know, you just you try to make sure you're doing things on your own, but you can't do this life on your own. And so I always appreciated him living the gospel, and that is the most important thing that I've, I've been able to take from him and looking to pay it forward. So Tom continues to be obedient in his call. We'll talk about obedience a lot today. In his call as pastor. Now the office of pastor is a God-ordained ministry. So in Ephesians 4 and 11, it says he calls some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now the task of pastor sometimes can feel isolated, can feel like you're on an island, can feel like it's heavy and too heavy to carry your own, your own. Well, it is. But the only, the wonderful thing is we can stand firm in that God has already equipped past tense and prepared time for what he's going to do and endure here at peace. Let's pray. 
God, I just thank you again this morning. I ask that you would take this time to simplify your word, allow us to add it into our lives, and make us be better at advancing your kingdom by reaching others for Christ. So we thank you for Tom, we thank you for Shirley, and we thank you for the boys, TJ and Jacob. We ask that you to bless them and keep them safe, and that you would keep elevating their relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if I had to put a subject on it, it would just be simply a message for the saints. There was a song when I was in high school from Donald Lawrence, a message for the saints. My grandfather hated it. He was a pastor. He was a Methodist pastor from Mississippi. So if you can imagine hearing that song as a southern 70-year-old pastor from Mississippi, he was not a fan of it. He said, man, that sounds like something you hear in the juke joint. Now, I didn't know what the juke joint was at the time, but it was a club. It was like a club for on the, down in the deep south. And so we're going to be talking today from Hebrews 13 and four verses in particular, 7, 8, 17, and 18. Now, I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open. We're going to reference other scriptures that clarify and clear up some of the things we're going to tackle in this passage here in Hebrews. Now, in chapter 13, let's read the text first. In verse 7, I apologize, I was just going in. In verse 7, chapter 13 in Hebrews, it reads, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. I'm going to drop down to 17, 18. Obey your leaders. Don't tune out. Don't tune me out. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. As those who will give an account, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. Bless the Lord. So in Hebrews 13, there's a theme of respecting authorities. And it's also very common for them to talk about it in terms of a pastor in the church or a leader in the church or an elder in the church, however you want to put it in your mind. Those both words are used. But this, we're going to use today this passage to give us a game plan on how we can remain in sync with our leaders. The believers that this letter was written to have began to fall away. So in the New Testament, they call that term apostasy, where you begin to go away from the newfound freedom that they have in Christ and reaching back for the Old Testament religion that they knew and were very familiar with. Think of it like this. I I grew up with my grandparents. Uh, They were from Mississippi, so they were very uh, tough, so to speak. So um, we had a room that we could not go in. So she, my grandmother was very clear in her directions. We were never to be in this room because we tear up furniture, wrestling, and things like that with my brothers. So she was clear. We, were, we knew the word. We knew what she told us. But she caught me one day, and I was in a kindergarten. I was in the sixth grade, and I still remember this whooping. And she caught me jumping on her couch. But not only was I jumping on her couch in the room I can't go in, I had my shoes on, and I was supposed to have my shoes off at the door. So I still remember her face as she said, boy. And I stopped like I saw Jesus, like, oh, it's about to go real bad for me. And she, uh, so she then proceeds to say, baby, you done lost your whole mind, but I'm going to help you find it right now. And so the author here in Hebrews is trying to help this group of believers find and retake their spiritual freedom and their spiritual mind. That's what he was after. Throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament, there's a theme of following godly leadership following that example, and imitating that example. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul opens it up. He says, look, be imitators of me, just as I am imitators of Christ. He then goes to the, and when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he says in Ephesians 5, so Paul again, be imitators this time of God as beloved children, walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. 
This is going to bring us to our first point, somebody watching me. So everybody is going to, I was going to sing the song, but the way my voice is set up, um, I don't think I'll be doing that. So, uh, but we all heard that song, and, you, and it feels like the last part is key, and it feels like I have no privacy. And as a, as you, when you're living the gospel, at times it's uncomfortable, and it's going to feel like you don't have any privacy because somebody's always looking to learn and grow from your life. So look at the verse 7. It says, remember those who spoke the word to you. So remember here is meaning to imitate the actions of those who have spoken the word to you. As we interpret, look at the interpret scripture with scripture, let's look at Peter and his relationship with Christ and how the imitation took place. First, we see Christ. So Christ starts in heaven with God. He is an eternal being, right? He can't die. He can't feel pain. So they had to plan ahead of time a body for him so that he could feel the pain and so that he could be an atoning sacrifice for all of us. So that had to be planned way ahead of time. But he had to be a very humble guy, which well, he's a spirit, so he's not good. But he was, the humility that he showed to take on flesh for you and I so that we could go free, that is something that will starts the emulation process. So then Peter begins and he walks with Christ. Now Peter gets it wrong quite a bit, but so do we. So that is something we can take and, and have hope that no one, this guy that wrote books and finished the gospel in his life, left a legacy, something we can all take. Like none of us are going to get this right every day. But we continue to walk, we continue to grow. So in 1 Peter 5, Peter gives us some characteristics that we can look at for leadership. Now, we're not going to read through them all, but there was a few that I wanted to highlight today. But in your quiet time this week, if you get a chance, go back to 1 Peter 5 and look through it. We all have quiet time daily. You ever try to turn a lamp on that's not plugged in? It's a hard thing to do. So when we don't pray daily and at that quiet time daily, we're not plugging into that source that makes life very chaotic. That was, a, I, that was an ouch moment for me in preparation. So, uh, <laughs> so the imitation relationship between Christ and Peter. So then we see Peter walk with Christ, right? He was in that inner sanctum. He was one of the three. And then he also, this is who Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on you, right? So this could really give him an ego, a big head, so to speak, like, oh, I'm the man now. He building his whole church. He putting it all on my back, right? No, it doesn't give him that because in 1 Peter 5, he said, I exhort you as your fellow elder. That means he, does, he puts himself no higher than the rest of the leaders that he's reaching out to. I'm just one of the guys that's out here trying to get it right and move the kingdom forward. So that humility that we see there is key. He didn't let his title from Christ impact his humility. The, less, the next thing we see is he tells him to shepherd the flock. Shepherd the flock. Shepherding in this time was very critical. Sheep are not the best of animals. Uh, they're stubborn. They have poor eyesight. So this leads to them having to have someone with them, protecting them, keeping them safe at all times. Feed the flock. And the word is here is meaning preach the word of God. Teach the word of God. Make sure that they have it. Your flock has that, has those things. So as you're looking to find things to emulate, we're emulating that humility, and we're emulating feeding the flock. Okay, that's teaching the word of God. Those are things that we're looking to emulate or to imitate. The next was protect the flock. Here we want to make sure we keep false teaching far from the church. It has infiltrated the church. After to infiltrate the church back in these times. Same thing. But what we know, sound doctrine always stands on top above, and you'll feel peace in your spirit with that sound doctrine that you get. But the one way you can check it, just going to put it out there, this last time I'm going to, pump this up, is in your quiet time, in your studies. Got it. Leadership by manipulation and intimidation is what our world teaches us. Do it this way. If not, you got to put the fear of God in them and go get it done. This is the way the world teaches us that we lead, right? That's how you see coaches coach. I see these elementary coaches going crazy, and I'm like, dude, chill. Ow, you are not going to the Bengals next week. Off of this peewee game. Like, just relax. So we want to see a form of biblical leadership. We look to 1 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse 12. Timothy is dealing with 
older men, you know how older men are, I just forgot more Bible than he know. What's he going to teach me? And so Timothy is here, and he's struggling. And Paul tells him, look, don't let nobody look down on you because you're young. But rather in speech, in conduct, in love, faith, and purity, show yourself to be an example to them. That's what's going to win them over is your example. It's not going to be the words you say. It's not going to be you do this on thing one day and don't do it the next day. It's going to be a consistent biblical example that is going to win them over and is going to help you lead them to where they need to go. The second part of verse 7 says, remember your leaders. This is tough to do if you don't actively watch. There's a difference between watching and I'm actively watching. Think of it this way. My dad has been the guy who's always changed my brakes. That's been his rub. My job in that process was to bring comedic relief and to be out there to create conversation, but I was just out there just watching. But I wasn't watching like I need to do this one day. I was just out there like I'm just going to make sure it looked bad that my dad is out here working. I'm in the house in the air. It looked bad. So, but this summer my dad says, look, man, I'm getting old. It's time for you to learn how to change your own brakes so you can show your sons how to change their brakes. It's time. So I was like, man, I've been, I've been watching you for about 10 years now. Man, I'm ready. So he turned me loose. I got the tire off, and that was it. That was the end of it. <laughs> I was like, uh, what you want me to do now? So I wasn't ready. So he said, all right, I'm going to change this driver's side, but I want you to watch, knowing that you're going to go change this passenger side, and I'm not helping you. I'm going in the house. I was like, oh, man, that's a lot of pressure. In my mind, I'm seeing the wheel come off and the brakes not working and my family in there. So I was under pressure just a little bit. So I then I go over to the passenger side after watching him, but I'm watching him and I'm asking questions. Like, hey, so you're taking that caliber off and you're putting it up there so you don't put no stress on that wire? Okay, I get that. I said, that pin, why are you taking that pin out? Because you got to do that to get the brake shoes out. I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. All these years, I had watched it, but I had never watched it actively knowing that I was about to go have to do it. That's the same way we need to come in here every Sunday, every Wednesday. We need to come in here as active watching. We need to be knowing, I'm going to have to leave these four walls, and I'm going to that mission field. And that mission field is a grind. That mission field will take all the joy up out of you. So the way that you fight that is you come in here and be active listening when the word is being preached, whether that's through Pastor Tom, whether it's through a minister, Whoever the case may be, there's a lot of studying that goes into preaching the Word of God. So in the week when we're out doing life, working, making sure the kids are good, watching uh, football on Monday night and uh, Thursday night and Saturday and Sunday, I may be preaching to myself there, but yeah, Tom is studying every day and praying and laboring for each one of us. And he's doing that because that's his call as pastor. But it's also our call to walk beside him and not have him and leave him on the island. So when you go to remember that word, think about it this way. When have you, when's the last time you have spoken the word of God to anybody else outside of Peace Baptist? If that, if that, if you can't answer that, then there's some work that we need to do. And it's not a, a place of embarrassment. It's a place of knowing that we are all in this together, running this race. Some of us are going, are already in tip-top shape. If you go out to run a mile, I'm not there. I'm not going to be running that mile. If I'm running the mile, then something's chasing me. Y'all better make sure you beat me. So, <laughs> but the gathering that we come in here for is to recharge your batteries and to encourage you and to educate you so you're versed in the word for when you go out to the mission field. That's going to lead us to our second point. I need you to stay with me. A lot of people don't have issues with this point. Our, le- our second point is submission always comes down to two questions. Am I going to obey God and do I trust God? Those are two questions that you always have to wrestle with in this, when you're dealing with submission. Verse 17 says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Submission is always tough for our flesh to grasp. It's a tough concept. We don't want nobody telling us where we're missing the mark because I got it, right? I already got it. When I was going through marriage counseling, my cousin was a pastor at the time in uh, Indianapolis, and he was giving me and my wife marriage counseling. So I came in, and I was like, man, all we really need to do is that Ephesians 5.22, baby. 
So let's get that going. And uh, he tells me, so Ephesians 5.22 is, wives, submit to your husbands. And uh, he shut the door. He was like, nope, we're actually going to start in uh, 5.25. I said, what? I said, you're supposed to be my cousin. And so 5.25 says, husbands need to love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself like a ransom with this. And this is a sacrificial love. This means you don't expect anything back in return. You expect zero, but I still choose to love that my wife every day is my responsibility. And from that flows the, 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 whether the marriage is going to be positive or negative. And I was like, man, this dude just, this dude just rocked me a little bit here. So I'm, uh, but I appreciated that because it gave me a foundation for marriage, and it gave me a foundation for submission. So we should not want anybody to submit to mess. And anytime, many times, when you have people or who have trouble with submission, they've either had the church hurt from a pastor, from a leader, from a fellow member, or they've had you know, a, a spouse who, you know, was not somebody they could submit to. But when you have a wife who's had a husband who was str- striving to live for Christ, it is easier for her to submit because she's not submitting to him. She's submitting to the word of God. Christ served us in spite of us. Not out of spite. Sometimes we serve out of spite. Like when he asked me to take the trash out in the fourth quarter and Burrow got the ball and he going down the field and he said, hey, can you take this trash out and uh, hold the baby while I'm getting dinner ready? Yes, it is fourth quarter. But uh, <laughs> but I'm still, I may call my 17-year-old, like, hey, man, get your brother. But uh, I'm definitely going to delegate that responsibility. But I'm going to also know that there's some things that we've got to make sure, no matter what the situation, what I'm saying is that it's clear that we have to make sure we choose to obey the word of God. Now, when you find yourself with submission and you're having troubles with it, that's okay. So what you do is you take that struggle and you give it to God. And what he's saying, Peter, he says, cast your burdens on me, all your anxiety, because he cares for you. That, that constitutes an anxiety. If I can't answer whether I, I trust God or I'm going to obey God, that's something i got to make sure that I bring to him honestly and also my wise counsel. It's okay to have wise counsel, and it's okay to seek them in these responsibilities to pray with you. So consider David and Saul for us to look at your being obedience, right? Saul was the king. David was the king, but Saul, David replaces Saul. Saul, it got so bad with him and God, God regretted that he made him king. The only way in scripture it says he regretted that he made him king. When Saul was corrected, Saul was like, please don't take this kingdom from me. Let me make sure I keep my kingdom, keep my stuff, keep my situation. When David, who was apple of God's eye, but he was a murderer, some might say he was a rapist as a king, calling a woman to marry a woman to his chamber. If you say no, could, life could get tough for you at the end of time. So, but when he was faced with his issues, his mindset, his heart was, don't take your love from me. Versus, the, he said, you can have this kingdom. You can have all these servants. You can have it. Just don't take your love from me. And that's what God was looking for. Your why is always important. Your why you serve. Those are always important. We have, in verse 17, we see where it says, the end of the verse is, let them do this with joy and not with grief, as this is unprofitable for you. Our job as the body, as the saints, is to make sure we walk alongside Tom. And we do that by being obedient to the word of God. Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. It's a laborious undertaking. In Acts 6, the disciples face this issue. They're brought, in, they're brought a concern, and they're, people want them to intervene and interact. Well, what they decided, they called a meeting, and they said, look, we are called to do prayer and the ministry of the word. That is what we're called to do. 
That is our main focus. In the office of pastor, the main focus is to pray and minister the word to the flock. Make sure you're getting sound teaching every week, and they're covering you in prayer. As they're doing this, the disciples then handle it by saying, look, you find seven men, spiritually mature, who are ready to, to lead, and you have them and handle that situation. They were clear on their call. My call is to make sure I'm praying and that I'm ministering in the word. Those are clear. Now, the other thing, we can't continue to just pound stuff on the pastor and we just sit back and be like, oh, that's cool. Come on and entertain us and get us right. That's not, that's not what the word wants to do. The word wants us to say, where am I supposed to be? Where am I supposed to lead? And they join us in that prayer and they join us in that directive. But that's what uh, another ouch moment as I was preparing. So as I'm working through, brings us to our third point. Our, verse 18. Now our third point is in verse 18, but it's in addition to imitating the pastor, we are also to cover him in prayer. Verse 18 says, pray for us, for we are sure we have a good conscience. New Testament is clear that you don't violate your conscience. If you feel like you shouldn't be doing it, you shouldn't be doing it. Because if you continue to go against it, and Timothy says you can sear or singe that off. Like when you have a, when you're trying to use a, a welder and you weld in a piece, you can singe off that, your conscience and start to do other things. So you never violate your conscience, which is in most cases the Holy Spirit. Pray for us, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. So here they give us a way to pray for time. We don't even have to be in this business. All we need to do is have, there's many scriptures that we can use to pray for Tom, to pray for Shirley, to pray for every believer. So I try to stress daily to, that I pray for every believer everywhere and the non-believers as well. These are things that we make mention of in our prayer time daily. Because many times what we're trying to do is, how can I pray for you specifically, is we want to be able to share the tea. And share the tea just means I'm about to go gossip. That's really what it means. And Proverbs says gossiping is like a choice morsel that goes down to the innermost parts. That means we enjoy sharing the tea. And we got to really check ourselves in that department that if I'm, if I'm going to tell them, is to have them come with me to pray. I'm not going to say, man, can you believe this? That, is, that creates people, hurt Christians, and hurt Christians go out and they deteriorate religious experiences for everybody else. So one thing we know is God is always faithful, and he always blesses obedience. And so when we step out on faith, as Tom has, even if you're stepping out unsure, uncertain of exactly what the end is going to be, when you still take that step, God meets you right there. And he promises that he's going to perfect it until we lead his earth. That's his promise to us. So what we do is we continue to strive each day, knowing now, yes, I'm going to make mistakes. No, I don't have it all figured out. But he's promised me that he's going to continue to perfect me every day till I get to the other side. Last thing I want to talk about is encouragement. Um, as we celebrate Tom today, we want to make sure that we are encouraging Tom and encouraging each other. When you come here, it should be a time of encouragement. Because, like I keep saying, you're going back out to live this thing, and it's a tough process, especially in the current state of the world we live in today. God's kingdom agenda, he doesn't need us, he chooses to use us. And so he's using us to advance his agenda. And we have free will whether we're going to obey him or we're going to continue to do what we feel is comfortable or what makes things easier for us. Because God's journey, most times, has a, uh, a lot of hurdles in it. But if he would have shown you the hurdles and the jumps, and the, you would have never taken the step to go. So when we keep in mind, Pastor Tom is an imperfect person. But all of us are imperfect people. So we take that and we move forward knowing and trusting God. And if you've got any, time, any issues with trusting God in this life can lead you to a, a, some dark places. Because trusting God lets you know when everything's going crazy, he promised he would never leave us, right? 
Now, we either trust that or we sit and we, we follow our own path, and your own path always leads to places you don't want to be or you shouldn't have been. Confidence in time and confidence in God, they're synonymous because confidence in God is where we are. If we, have, we know God sent time to lead Peace Baptist, and we know that we have to stand with him because God has sent him here to lead. Now, we trust that or we don't, but you can't do both. We got to get off the fence. That was another ouch moment. Just I like to put my ouch moments out and get them off my chest. So, But when we do this, man, we create a thriving spiritual community that we can use and utilize to continue to walk with Christ. And I thank you for your time, and uh, God bless you.